Endless ocean is a phrase that conjures up images that dwarf what it means to be human. We find comfort in the explored and the safe, yet despite all our advances, the ocean remains as vast and unknowable as ever. It's this unease, however, that draws us to it. The ocean is an alien world that surrounds us all. Endless Ocean is a game where you can pet fish. It was released by Eureka in 2007 in Europe and Japan. America and Australia would have to wait until January of the next year. The premise of the game is that you're helping a marine biologist named Kat conduct research. She can't swim, and you aren't a marine biologist. Well, unless you are. Like, comment, and subscribe if you're a marine biologist. Dislike, uncomment, and unsubscribe if you aren't. The story is largely irrelevant until the end, merely serving to facilitate you chilling with some fish, mammals, cephalopods, and just about anything else you can think of down here in the deep blue sea. The main gameplay revolves around swimming to new locations and poking, petting, and feeding fish until your character divines an encyclopedia entry's worth of information about them. As the game progresses, you'll find different animals, some of which you can even ride. While this is, realistically, just the programmer rotating the character model and gluing it to the side of a whale, it sparks an emotional reaction as it is quite possibly the most zen thing I've ever done in a video game. When you pair this with the ambient breathing and the aquatic soundscape, it almost lets you forget that the world is one garbage fire after another. After all, the fire can't reach you underwater. There is music in the game, but I turn it off rather quickly. This is partially so my screams wouldn't get copyright strikes, but also partially because all the songs sound the same. Using one artist for all of them gave them a very cohesive vibe, but it also means that I can hardly tell when one song ends and another begins. Further, since one of the songs is Amazing Grace, it just sounds like an incongruously patriotic six hours of your life. While you're on the boat, there's a jukebox you can use to play a song from the SD card instead of listening to the included soundtrack. The astute among you may realize that I said song, not songs. This is because you can only set the song on the boat. No matter how many songs you have on the SD card, it will only play that one on loop until you return to the boat and change it. Had this been implemented differently, I would have gotten much more use out of this feature. That being said, I spent most of the game listening to Cafeteria by Jakey, Not Dead Yet, also by Jakey, and Saint Like by Johann Sebastian Bach. Just kidding, that was also Jakey. The right music, or lack thereof, ties this package together to be nothing short of entrancing. With such simple and intuitive controls, it's easy to get lost in the gorgeous scenes the game puts you in. There are some minor oddities with the controls, like the fact that you can just be tilted with very little recourse to correct, or the fact that turning 180 degrees requires you to treat the Wii Remote like a shake weight. Despite this, the simplicity of just pointing and pressing B to go keeps the movement feeling natural. We're getting back to the story, so if you don't want to hear spoilers for this 10-year-old game, skip to the 4-minute mark. The story does become a bit more complex later on as you learn that Kat's father died looking for a mythical beast. When Kat thinks she may have the opportunity to finish her father's work, the goal of the game becomes much more whale-focused as you track the migratory routes of each of the whales in the game looking for the ancient mother, a giant albino blue whale. I debated a lot on whether or not I should show the ancient mother in the video or even mention her, but as one of only two legendary animals in the game, I figured it needed to be in for documentation. After you've explored over 60% of the map, an old ship with a hole blown in the side will appear in-game. Incidentally, this is the only time popping your head out of the water is in any way necessary. Once you find and board the ship, it'll be swept away by currents to a ship's graveyard. Cat thinks the name is a bit depressing, and instead opts to call it Ship's Rest. Here's where you find the second and final legendary, Magutapa, a massive scarred great white shark who is, unfortunately, not rideable. In this area, you can also find some interesting scenery and a few animals you haven't seen before. Unfortunately, there is very little left to do after you've been to Ship's Rest. You can go anywhere and wander aimlessly, but likely the only thing you'll have left to do is find items which normally only show an extra line of text and, at most, show you a new animal such as the orca. This is, to my mind, one of the biggest sins of the game. The only other criticisms I would rank as high are the fact that you have to move the boat and can only swim a certain distance from it, as well as the fact that animals are not to scale. These may be due to technical limitations, like not being able to load seamlessly on the Wii hardware, or not being able to render a model that large. But, Oblivion gave us 16 square miles in 2006, and it didn't even have the benefit of shitty draw distances. As for the oddly small whales, Shadow of the Colossus was able to give us a 500-foot sand snake on the PlayStation 2. None of these criticisms ruin the game for me, however. Endless Ocean was a game that I was so barely aware of and just happened to see it for $5, but it became my favorite game within the opening few hours. 
I enjoyed it so much that I bought the complete in-box sequel with the Wii Speak, an accessory that I can't even use since Nintendo servers are shut down. There is a homebrew program that allows you to connect as if the servers are still up, and I'm trying to get that working. If you have an American copy of the game and an internet-connected Wii, stay tuned.